Thank you. Good afternoon. Hope y'all are. I hope y'all are having a good day, and we're we're awfully glad to be with you. My name is Rita McCannon. I'm an attorney in Huntsville, Alabama. And my colleagues are. I'm Jack Barlow. I'm a professor of politics at Juniata College in Pennsylvania. Where are you guys exactly? Are you in D.C.? No. No, we're in oh. California. We're in California. <laughs> okay. All right. Tim, you're muted, Tim. Sorry. Uh, Tim Moore from the University of Wisconsin at Madison at the Center for the Study of the American Constitution. It's great to see you again. You guys tell us who you are and tell us who your teacher is. Good afternoon. We're at Foothill High School's Unit 2 representing the state of California. My name is Ishan Khan. My name is Sophia Freyer. My name is Olivia Jane. And my name is Rohan Penmacha. We would like to thank the audience, timekeeper, and judges for being here today, as well as introduce our coaches, Mr. Tedemore and Mr. McBride. Glad to have you all. Um, we're going to use question number two from Unit 2 today, and I will read it and then we'll get started. When explaining why the proposed constitution lacked a bill of rights, one federalist claimed that in a government possessed of enumerated powers, such a measure would be not only unnecessary, but preposterous and dangerous. Do you agree or disagree with the statement? Why or why not? In your opinion, did the first 10 amendments to the constitution sufficiently address the concerns of the anti-federalists? To what extent, if any, should we consider adding additional amendments to our constitution? We look forward to hearing from you and you may begin. During ratification debates, the Federals employed maximum effort in promoting the constitution, including leveling constant rebuttals against the Anti-Federalist plea for a Bill of Rights. We believe that James Wilson was incorrect as a Bill of Rights is necessary and not preposterous or dangerous. A Bill of Rights is essential in an enumerated government because it reaffirms the grand security to the rights of the people as envisioned in Brutus II. The Bill of Rights has allowed the Supreme Court to protect fundamental rights, such as the right of speech in the 1925 case of Gitlow v. New York. However, the Bill of Rights was rarely used until the 14th Amendment, mostly due to Baron v. Baltimore in 1833, which stated that the Bill of Rights didn't apply to the states. As a majority of judicial proceedings happened in state courts, the Bill of Rights often didn't concern the people. Moreover, James Wilson was mistaken about the Bill of Rights being preposterous and dangerous. In Federalist 84, Hamilton explains this dangerous sentiment because enumerated rights would exclude certain rights. The Ninth Amendment, however, which state a right cannot be construed to deny other rights, addresses fear. The Ninth Amendment has helped protect unenumerated rights, such as the right to, such as the right to marriage, which was recognized in 1960 seven case loving me Virginia. The Bill of Rights addressed the anti-federalist desire for an enumeration of civil liberties, but failed to address their wish for structural changes. For instance, out of the 20 items in anti-federalist Richard Henry Lee's amendment proposal, the 17 regarding individual rights were adopted in the U.S. Bill of Rights, but Madison specifically left out the structural amendments, such as increasing the size of the House of Representatives. These structural concerns, however, were central to the anti-federalist fear that the new government would devolve into tyranny. Cato III stated that the Senate and executive would prevent either from being a check upon the other. Anti-federalist feared that there would be collusion between the three branches and no separation of powers, insinuating that the checks and balances would only lead to oppressive government. Additionally, in Brutus I, Brutus states that representatives wouldn't know the minds of their constituents. Most anti-federalists feared the relatively small size of the House of Representatives, as its 65 members was even smaller than Rhode Island's legislature. But despite the constant anti-federalist push for structural changes, the Bill of Rights was never going to resolve these concerns. The Congress, after ratification, was federalist-dominated and would not have allowed other amendments proposed by anti-federalists or the state conventions to be ratified because the federalists strongly fought for the structure in the Constitution. Regarding future amendments, we believe we should consider them to a great extent. Structural flaws have become more apparent in recent years, reflected by the lack of adequate representation. Additionally, while the Supreme Court can discover individual rights, they're only truly secured when enumerated. One structural amendment would be addressing the Electoral College, which was established because the framers feared the common man. For example, 
George Mason compared direct election to letting a blind man pick between two colors. As the president has been elected without the popular vote twice in the last five in the last five elections, the need for a national popular voting system today is clear. Despite the numerous possible individual rights amendment, the most pressing one today is a right to bodily autonomy. While cases like Griswold v. Connecticut of 1965 and Roe v. Wade of 1973 establish protections for contraceptives, contraceptives and abortion, it has become clear that these decisions can be reversed by the Supreme Court. In the 2021 case, Whole Woman's Health v. Jackson, the court failed to block a Texas heartbeat bill that violated the right to reproductive privacy. And individual states like Mississippi are beginning to pass similar legislation. Although amendments seem unlikely in the current gridlock Congress, amendments have often arrived after partisanship. According to a 1904 Washington Post article, our fundamental law was practically unamendable. Yet less than a decade later, several amendments were ratified, and we again hope to see amendments ratified in the next decade. Thank you. We are now ready for your question. Okay. Um, do you all have any specific rights you are concerned about losing under our Constitution? Or conversely, do you, are there things about which you would like to see protected rights? Do you have rights that you would like to see enumerated or made more specific? One right that I would like to see is a right to education. Fortunately, as a delegate from California, we have the right to education highlighted in Article 5, Section 9 of our Constitution, but we don't see it in the Constitution of the U.S. government. And I believe that we need to parallel this because it is a fundamental right that is so essential to today. Um, so we need to incorporate this into our Constitution. Um, a right that we fear that we would lose would be the right to marriage. So with the current conservative Supreme Court, when uh, the right to bodily autonomy uh, where uh, abortion is being challenged, we believe that the right for marriage, which is fundamental, um, may be taken away by uh, the Supreme Court and we advocate it should be amended upon the Constitution. And another right that we see that's really under threat with the rise in social media and technology is the right to privacy. Under Article 4, I mean, Amendment 4 of our Constitution, the framers protect specifically papers. And at that time, papers were the main form of communication. And if we look to today, it's become technology that's the real form of communication between people. So I believe that we should strive to protect our technology from big corporations that are impeding on our data, like, like the Euro Europe is doing with their GDR people program regarding their privacy protections. So I want to ask, um, if you were going to change, uh, you're going to change some things, but if you were an anti-federalist in 1787, would you have insisted that the word expressly uh, be in the 10th Amendment? And why? What, do you, what effect do you think it would have? Um, absolutely. If I was an anti-federalist, I would want the word expressly to be within um, the Constitution, um, because um, in the um, in in the um, in the in the Articles of Confederation, um, Article Six of the Articles of Confederation have the word um, um, expressly within the Constitution. However, that word, while it was fought for, um, it wasn't. Um, it, it didn't end up being there. Um, and states really wanted this because um, we can see without that there. Um, they feared that huge, strong central government. However, without that, they didn't have that. And Thomas Tudor Tucker of South Carolina basically proposed this when, after James Madison in introduced his Bill of Rights and specifically the 10th Amendment. He said, why don't we say expressly delegated in the 10th Amendment as well? And the, the Senate re re rejected it with a vote of 32 to 17 because they feared that it would go back to the Articles of Confederation. So if I was an anti-federalist, I would argue for that. But I like disagree with the anti-federalist point because Otherwise, the go government or Congress wouldn't be able to get anything done, just like under the Articles of Confederation. Brutus II also highlights this fear in, Brut uh, in Brutus II. Um, so he says that um, the federal government under the Constitution can encroach upon everything that's fundamental to human happiness, which would include life, liberty, and property. And be because the enumerated government wasn't limited to its expressly enumerated powers, and therefore the government would intrude on... Um, the rights of states and people. Uh, let me give you a hypothetical bill of rights. You're, you're in the first Congress in 1789. You're in the first Congress, and here's the hypothetical bill of rights. The Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. You're going to vote for it? 
I would personally vote for it. As James Wilson said, um, he said that the Bill of Rights, one of the biggest problems with it is that people would look to the Bill of Rights as their ultimate source of rights. And that would be the fundaments to it. And there would be no other source. And I would agree with Federalists that the Ninth Amendment would serve as a compensation towards that, as it would enable other rights through implied and enumer to implied powers from those enumerated rights. I would like to concur with my unit mate here. If I was a Federalist in the first uh, Congress, I would absolutely vote for the uh, Ninth and uh, Tenth Amendment because it pretty much reaffirms the Federalist argument in um, Federalist uh, uh, 84 for the uh, Ninth Amendment and a Federalist uh, 45, where states are left with numerous and indefinite powers for the Tenth Amendment. So these two amendments, as a Federalist, I would feel that um, reaffirms my ideas and uh, my uh, neglects the previous opposition I had for the Bill of Rights. Let me follow up with this. Do you think then uh, that would have forced the courts to function like Britain and creating common law and creating rights? I think we see that the Ninth and Tenth Amendment have rarely, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment specifically has rarely been used. So even if it was put into place, we haven't seen the Ninth Amendment used until the case of 1965 with Griswold v. Connecticut. And if you read the dissenting opinion by Justice Potter Stewart, he says that the Federals intended for the clause to be merely declaratory. So it, they didn't intend for the courts to actually use it. They just wanted it to appease the opposition as as in his original speech on June 8th of 1789, James Madison's first line was supposed to be, it's not needed, but let's just do it to basically appease the others. So I would believe that it wouldn't matter that much because the Federalists didn't want it to matter at that time. Um, adding on to my unit mate's point, um, Brutus once says that when a government um, strays, like is too distant from the people, then it can't properly govern. Um, and with the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, even as a Federalist, you'd want those ratified because while it does appease the people, it also is, as my unit mate said, merely declaratory. And while um, and while courts definitely um, can declare the constitutionality of laws by Congress, they don't necessarily make them. Do you think that uh, that the courts have been the primary means of uh, carrying out uh, the Bill of Rights, or has has how has the majority worked to uh, uh, in terms of our respect for rights, but also in in terms of the the threats to rights? I do think that the courts are heavily responsible for the Bill of Rights. I would argue for Gordon. Um, for Gordon Hilton's, um, he's a legal professor, and he said that the Bill of Rights was basically defective until its incorporation. And incorporation doesn't occur without the court's approval. And that's why I would argue today that we need to see the Seventh Amendment incorporated, even though it, was, um, it wasn't incorporated in, as it was ruled in um, uh, Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad Company versus Rodriguez of 1916. It was, it's still such a fundamental right and the courts have the power and they're the ultimate power that garners that. So I think that there just needs to be incorporation as that's what um, the Bill of Rights truly does entail. Uh, but it's equally important to know that the courts should not be the sole um, interpreter of rights because fundamental rights should be amended into our constitution or written into legislation. For example, in Germany, they uh, have uh, the right of marriage written in their uh, constitution. Th this, um, then this right wouldn't be easily overturned by an individual court and can be um, uh, applied to the people at all circumstances. Well, it would, but would a, a, um, an amendment that says the right to marriage is protected, does that mean marriage between two people of the same gender? Um, in my mind, yes, that would mean marriage would be protected for two people of the same gender. Well, that is technically protected as the 2015 case of Obergefell v. Hodges under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. We can see that with the Supreme Court, as my unit mate said earlier, um, may that may not be the case in future years. However, um, we, in an amendment, that would be protected. I think it's important to see that we've seen amendments negate like uh, court decisions. If you look to the case of 1895, from Pollock v. Farmers Co. They basically said the Wilson and Gorman tariff acts were unconstitutional. And then a few years later, because Congress wanted to regulate alcohol, they proposed the 16th Amendment, which essentially gave Congress the ability to direct tax. And this is a form of Congress using their separation of powers that was established by James Madison in Federalist 51 to go around the Supreme Court's decision that, they, that the people completely dis disagreed with. Does it make a difference um, 
Well, let me back up. Um, what is the difference between English theory, British theory of rights, and American theory of rights? Um, well, I think uh, if we look at the American theory of rights, we need to look at the two types of rights that are included in our Bill of Rights. These are procedural rights and natural rights. So procedural rights derives from the English common law, including Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights, and includes, uh, for example, the Sixth Amendment protection uh, of a speedy trial or the Seventh Amendment uh, protection of right to trial by jury. And then looking at that natural rights aspect, we see that the, federal, the framers like George Mason really learned from John Locke and his two treaties of government in 1689, where he said all rights derive from life, liberty, and property and their derivations of that. So I Okay, but where do, where do rights come from? I would agree, argue that our rights come when we go in, when we make a social contract, like, like Thomas Hobbes said in his Leviathan in 1650, 1651, when we get, when we come together, we have to give up, we make, we get some rights because we're coming into a society. Um, however, okay. Hey, um, you said so much we couldn't keep up. Okay, I couldn't. I couldn't write fast enough, and some of these gentlemen could not. They couldn't do any better. So um, I, I want to go through, but I really, really liked some of your answers to me about what you would, uh, what you would love to see changed, the the amendments that you would like to see done. Um, I really, really enjoyed your your forward thinking. Uh, in terms of the, the amendments you would like to see brought about. Those were great. Yeah, I, I guess I'll chime in. I think uh, your opening statement was very thorough. Um, the, uh, and the fact you camped out and did a really, really nice explanation of the division amongst the anti-federalists, those who wanted rights and those who wanted uh, structure. Um, I, I would say, I, I, maybe as a, a, a little suggestion to think about that, the second convention looms large here. Um, and uh, there's a calculated effort to cut that movement off right at the knees. And, and uh, so maybe just a, a little bit more there on the history on, on Madison's role. The, uh, I especially uh, liked your, uh, uh, your response to, uh, to Jack's question on expressly. I thought your analysis there was very good, uh, and uh, and for at least for a little bit, we I got somebody to admit that maybe Wilson was onto something there. Maybe the Ninth Amendment is enough. Uh, so uh, yeah, we had to rescue James Wilson from being uh, disparaged the whole ten minutes. But uh, so I thought that was a, a thoughtful analysis too. Uh, so there's you've demonstrated you know the history, and. Uh, you know, for me, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's all there is is history. So I appreciated your analysis using history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I too thought that your your opening statement was uh, you you did a nice job of sort of balancing the the concerns uh, around the second convention around the uh, uh, anti federalist arguments um, and then moving on up to up to today and. Um, uh, so I thought that was good. I, uh, you did say that, uh, at, at least I, I thought I heard you say that Loving v. v Virginia relied on the Ninth Amendment, um, which I, I, I don't remember that, but uh, I could be wrong. Uh, but I, you know, that's, I mean, it's, it, it, it certainly didn't rest its, uh, uh, its argument on the, on the Ninth Amendment. Um, you raised an interesting question about the Fourth Amendment, right? That the Fourth Amendment protects papers. Um, but of course, the Fourth Amendment also protects houses and effects. Um, so what is, it, what is an effect? Uh, Rita's a lawyer, and she probably has a good answer for this. But, um, but you, you raised that question in my mind. And that's, but that's what's fun about this, is that you, know, you guys can, can, can make a statement, and, and then I start going, oh, oh my goodness, what? Um, you talked about the Pollock case and taxation. 
Um, I'm pretty sure that was income taxation and that that's what the 16th amendment is about. Um, I, I, my recollection is that there was not, there was not a liquor, uh, connection there that excise taxes on liquor, uh, would already have been, uh, permitted by the taxation clause. Um, but again, I, I'm open to correction on that. And, uh, I thought that you guys, uh, I mean, look, this is a this is an important conversation. Um, you guys are well equipped to be participants in this conversation. Um, you've got knowledge, you've got information. You showed us that you've got a framework to put it all in, and where you believe that that all of these components belong. Um, that's really, really important. And as you go off doing whatever it is that you're doing, um, you're going to be engaged in these discussions for a long time. Um, you're going to be great participants in that. Um, and I really appreciate the time to spend, uh, spending that. Uh, yeah, it was nice to spend time with you today. And uh, I hope I'll see you again. Thanks. I really enjoyed, very much enjoyed your presentation today. And I think I've said this a couple of times before, but I think my colleagues will um, in, uh, tolerate me just a moment. It's so exciting and it's so uh, satisfying to us to hear how smart you are and how knowledgeable you are and the fact that you are going to be the leaders of our future. When we're in the old folks home and we need somebody looking after us on national level and even on your local levels, wherever you may be, it makes me feel good to know that you will be there. So thanks a lot for what you've learned and what you've told us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.